the Drake Equation, named after Frank Drake. Frank Drake was giving a, a presentation um, in, I believe, the 1950s and uh, maybe early 60s. And Drake, uh, for this uh, presentation he was giving, this lecture, he decided to break up the problem of are we alone in the universe into a bunch of smaller questions. And it was hoped then that we could maybe have better luck at answering some of the small questions uh, help us on our way to answering the larger question. This equation is unlike most equations. It has no particular answer, at least at this point, because we don't have enough data. We just do our best to estimate each of the seven parts of his equation. All right, so each, each part is a question that's part of a larger question of, you know, are there other intelligent life forms in our galaxy that we can talk to right now? Uh, that's N. That's what you're solving for, sort of, in this equation, N. Okay? Are there folks out there right now, aliens, that we can communicate with? That's the hope, to give us an estimate and to look at this in a logical, rational way. So, let's get started on the terms. First up, to have life, uh, we think that you really need stars, at least to have intelligent life. Uh, stars are the source of light and heat, uh, for planets. And so the first thing we look at, and you notice that we're, we're limiting this to our galaxy. That's very important to note. Okay. I don't know of any scientist that, that thinks that there's not intelligent life somewhere else in the universe. Again, with so many stars out there, it's just, you can't imagine otherwise, but how about within our galaxy? Well, do we know this? Yes, we do. We have a pretty good estimate, uh, of how many stars, probably around 200 billion stars in our galaxy. So I'm going to do two things as we go through these seven terms. I'm going to talk about uh, whether they're a positive or negative towards there being life. And I'm going to talk about how well we know the answer. And this is one we can say we have a very good uh, approximation for the number of stars and it's a positive. Okay. It's like a whole swimming pool full of sand where every grain of sand is a star in our galaxy. That's a, that's a good starting point. That's a lot of different places to start for life. So this is a positive. Look at that beautiful picture there, uh, of our Milky way. Wow. All right. Interesting trees in that one too. Next up. We also think then that to have life, you're not going to have intelligent, advanced life existing in a star. Uh, we think that, um, um, oh, I'm sorry. What, I'm sorry. What we need first, I'm, I'm skipping terms here, uh, and not just any star, uh, but we're really looking for stars that are somewhat like the sun. Here's why. When you look at those type O and B stars down there, the problem with them, they give off plenty of light and heat, but they burn out too quickly. We know that life on Earth took billions of years to evolve intelligence and technology, and it's hard to imagine that a star that explodes after 10 million years would have had time uh, to evolve such advanced life. So we're really ignoring the O and the B stars, maybe some of the A stars, for time purposes. Oh, and you know what? That's not a big thing because there aren't that many of those stars. Those are the most rare type of stars, especially the O type. Um, at the other extreme, the problem with the M-type stars is, look at, the, look at the top of the picture. This represents the habitable zone for an F-type star, for a G-type star like our sun. Look at an M-type, a very thin, thin ring. Does that mean there couldn't be life there? No, not at all. We should absolutely look at the M-type stars. But for the purposes of guessing on the fraction of, uh, you know, of life being out there, uh, we tend to just take a small fraction of stars that are most likely uh, to, to have planets in the right place in the habitable zone. So we only look at those stars. So we take a fraction of that swimming pool full of sand. Uh, we take out all of the O and B type stars. And I think in, a, in most cases, they take out a lot of the M type stars as well. And just look at the ones in the middle uh, as far as the stars go. That brings us to planets, okay? What fraction of planets have stars? And by the way, we know stars very well. So that's not a problem there. We understand stars. We know how many are type, uh, type G and type F and so forth. So that's not a problem. And it's a positive thing in the sense that we still have plenty of stars to choose from, even if we throw those out. Now, how about this one? When I started teaching, we didn't really know this term. I had to put a question mark on the board for this. And now, 
after all these years, since 1995, of finding planets around other stars, we're getting a much better estimate for this fraction. So that's really great. Um, it may be, it may work out to where there's just about one planet for every star. And more and more, we're thinking there are actually more planets, maybe to be five planets for every star. That's great, great news. This is a big positive that there are going to be plenty of planets out there around those stars that we just talked about, the ones with nice, fat, habitable zones for planets to exist. So we're, we're getting better and better at this one all the time. So that's great. That's a really great term for us, the fraction of stars with planets. Ah, but are all planets created equally? No, they're not. What fraction of those planets are what we consider to be Earth-like? Now, the, really the key, uh, as far as we know, is having liquid water on the surface or under the surface of a planet. And so that really leaves out the big gas giants. It's hard to imagine any kind of advanced life existing where all you have really is an atmosphere. Uh, but remember, those big planets can also have moons. So I don't think this is going to be a negative at all. And we're just now, just now on the cusp of being able to find these planets directly. And so it's looking pretty good. I don't think this will be a problem. There'll be plenty, billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy to choose from. And what makes them Earth-like? What allows them to have water on the surface? Well, how close they are to the star, of course, is probably the first thing we look at, that habitable zone. It depends on their atmosphere. And you see here, we break them down. We have Earths. We have super Earths that might also contain <clears throat> um, uh, life as well, advanced life, okay, that are in the habitable zone in the right place. Now, I think it's, it's helpful as well to, um, to think about this term Earth-like in terms of our own uh, solar system. And so where do we look for life within our own solar system? Not advanced life, uh, but at least uh, even microbes and things like that. Well, you're looking at one of the places we look, of course. Always number one on the list is Mars. Uh, because we know Mars had running water in the past. And it's looking very much, thanks to the Curiosity rover, uh, that there can be liquid water on it right now. Here's a, the, uh, here's a, a, a delta from billions of years ago when it clearly was much warmer, much more Earth-like. And then here's a more recent picture where water apparently flowed out of a crater, the side of a crater. And again, we're seeing more and more evidence of, of current water on Mars. Now, I'd be happy if we just found a fossil there. That would be amazing, okay, from billions of years ago. And remember, that life may have come here. We may all be Martians. We don't know. Uh, so that's one reason we study Mars so much. And, and the fact that it could have, if it has liquid water today, who knows, maybe underground, there are microbes that have survived those billions of years. It's very, very possible. And we're still learning about Mars. But Mars isn't the only place to look for life of course, in our solar system. How about Europa? I'd probably put Europa first or second on the list. I can't wait for us to go there and get under this icy crust where we know there's liquid water, an ocean of liquid water. We're still not sure how deep that ocean is. Um, this is a picture showing where you could have like a, a, a sort of a cavern with a lake under the ice. Man, I really want to explore Europa and, and send out a submarine to drill through the ice and then move around in there and try to find life on Europa. That would be fascinating. How about Enceladus? This moon's really moved up far on the list uh, because of this, because of these geysers that you see spraying out. That's a pretty recent discovery. You have water, you have heat, okay? Those are two of the big three, and the other one's organics. And there are a lot of organic compounds throughout the solar system, carbon compounds. So this now is a new place to look. That's one of Saturn's uh, smaller moons there, Enceladus. Not a very big place, uh, but it's become very, very interesting. I might put that third on the list. Um, another place that's quite interesting is Saturn's large moon, Titan. Um, it has plenty of organics. The one thing it's really lacking is the heat. It's incredibly frigid there. You're actually looking at the organics. This is the place that had liquid methane on the surface, seas of liquid methane. And, and Titan's a good place to think about maybe other types of chemistry that could happen, like a whole different kind of life. We'll talk about that more uh, later in this section. And finally, I think one that's moving up the list fast is Ganymede. 
the largest moon in the solar system, Jupiter's moon Ganymede, and we're starting to see uh, more and more where it looks like it has water as well. Just like Europa, just like its neighbor Europa, it looks like Ganymede is going to have liquid water uh, in these layers of ice, which make it another very interesting place to look for life. And I think this is a good stopping point because at that point um, in the equation, uh, we, we have some pretty good answers. We know how many stars there are. We know how many stars are sun-like stars, and we know how many stars roughly now have planets, and how many of those planets are going to be Earth-like. We at least have some pretty good guesses, pretty good estimates on all of those things. But the last few terms, well, a lot more speculation. We really don't know much at all, but it's still fun to speculate, and I'll save that for the next lecture. Thanks for listening.